All right, welcome everyone. Seven lecture of CS246. And today I'm gonna be talking to you about recommender systems. More specifically, this is the first lecture out of a model that will span until the end of Thursday. Today we're gonna be focusing on content-based systems and collaborative filtering. So let me give you first of all a recap of what I've been doing in the past few weeks and to understand why everything that we've built uh, is gonna lead us to uh, having a working recommender system solution. So mainly we've been dealing with highly dimensional data in the past few weeks, right? We've seen techniques like locality sensitive hashing, that basically they help us to find the nearest neighbors. Uh, then we work with clustering, basically find coherent sets of data that have certain characteristics in common. And last uh, Thursday we also work with dimensional dimensionality reduction. We have seen techniques like SBD and so forth. So, Today, what I'm going to be telling you about is the first application uh, from this course, and we're going to be talking about basically personalization. So how can we show to users data that is mostly relevant to them, okay? Let's start from an example. Uh, so this is me 15 years ago. No, no I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> though my musical tastes were probably arguable as much as this guy. So I was listening you know, to Metallica and Megadeth and Metal in general. I didn't have this amazing mullet, but you know, let's use this as our customer X. And say that in our you know, online platform for uh, buying CD, we also get our new customer Y, and this person search, searches for Metallica. So ideally, what we want to do in this case is not only to recommend uh, uh, Metallica CDs, because that's what the user search for, but we also want to tell him that, hey, there is this very cool band called Megadeth that you might be uh, uh, listening to that you might love, so why don't you buy those CDs as well, okay? This is the old foundation of why we care about recommender systems. Clearly, they don't apply only to e-commerce platforms, but as you can imagine, those were the main drivers why so much uh, research and so much development has been done in recommender systems. So, uh, let's have some other examples that don't relate only to uh, music. Uh, so we have our users, and then you know, we are a large platform, let's say we are Pinterest, or you know, anything that has a very large catalog, and the user searches for something. Uh, this search could be explicit, like it could be a text box where you're writing for something, you could be clicking on a certain item, so that it means there is some implicit interest for you to buy or to look for, I don't know, a new pair of shoes, and the system will start to recommend you similar things, okay? So that's the flow, the data flow. We, the user does a search and then it gets back some kind of recommendations. It turns out that there are plenty of platforms. There is just a small subset in there. Uh, clearly, uh, the big examples are like Amazon.com. They made a fortune out of you know, being able to build a very fast and effective recommender system, which you're probably using on a daily basis. Uh, we have platforms like you know, Google News or anything uh, where, you, where you get recommended relevant news. Um, YouTube is mostly driven by recommendations. You get recommended new videos, new channels, and there are also a lot of platforms related to music and so forth. So I don't think I have to convince you that uh, recommender systems, and in general, the concept of personalization is extremely pervasive, okay? Uh, to the extent that um, the, they say it's gonna be driving the you know, economy in the next decade or so. You know, this will be one of the main driving factors. Not only when it comes to e-commerce, but you can also think about personalized health or anything else where the user profile matters so much that all the information that is shown to the user is stemming from his or her own interest. Now, why, is recommend, uh, recomm why are recommender systems so relevant today compared to the past? So the reason is the following. We move from a context of uh, scarcity, so uh, of space on our ability of showing new information and new items to users, to an extreme abundance. So here's the example. Uh, if you go to a traditional retailer, you know, your uh, big box store, the shelf pay space is a scarce commodity to the extent that they sell it. You know, if, if you want to, I don't know, sell your very new cool gadget at Best Buy or anything like that, usually you are the person who's paying them to get shelf space. That's how important it is, because acquiring shelf space in a very big uh, box retailer means that it's working like a recommender system for you, because people are just gonna be walking around, and you know, the more premium is your shelf space, the more it's close, I don't know, to the cashier, the more opportunities you will have customers to look at your items, okay? So let's call this like primitive recommender systems. You were buying shelf space, and the closer you were to the customer, the more chances you had for them to buy your items, okay? 
Now we move to the web instead where disseminating information comes to pretty much zero cost. Uh, sometimes we would say also unfortunately because then we get all dissemination of fake news or you know any uh, trivial content that you might not care about, okay? But it turns out that platforms like Amazon or anything like that, they go from a scarcity of space to an abundance. You know, they have, they have catalogs with hundreds of millions of items and they will be happy to show them all to you. The bottleneck is not Amazon, the bottleneck is you, is your cognitive abilities of you know, being, uh, getting a waterfall of recommendations and items every day, okay? So we went from the scarcity to abundance, so, and what we have to do to make these platforms more efficient is to be able to filter the content that is mostly relevant to you, okay? So that's why we built recommendation engines. And I'm gonna be you know, telling you a, a short story about um, a couple of books that have both become bestsellers. And first of all, I recommend you to go and read this article, um, which you will find on these slides online. It's a very nice story regarding a long tail and re recommendation engines in the, in the past decade or so. So uh, let's take a look at this example. So both this book, Into Thin Air and Touching the Void, are books about uh, mountaineering disasters, you know, like, um, uh, mountaineers would try to uh, go up to certain mountains and then, you know, there uh, were storms and they got stuck and so forth. So I'm not gonna spoil the books in case you, you didn't read them. Uh, it, it turns out the following, that uh, uh, Into Thin Air is a more recent book than Touch the Void, all right? And for some reason, you know, like other content that goes viral, it got very good reviews by New York Times or other, you know, large newspapers, and then it became a bestseller. But only in a sudden, this book, which was published years before, and it was about the same topic, first of all, you know, the, the sales of this book started to rise very fast, so the publisher had to, you know, do uh, some reprints. And as of today, this book is selling at least twice the amount of copies of Him to Thin Air. What do you think happened there? And I'm gonna give you a clue. It's related to Amazon and the role that Amazon played in this story. What do you think happened? Sorry? Reviews change. Your close, it has more to do with recommendations. Correct, exactly. So Amazon re was recommending Touch in the Void because they learned that it's about the same topic. People usually give high reviews to both of them. So they say, yeah, why not? Through association rules, which is what we've seen during the first week, they were also recommending Touch in the Void. And then it turns out that people started to love that book, you know, and the reviews were amazing and the sales got, got up. And it turns out that it became a bestseller years after it was published, okay? So uh, this was very much unlikely in the past, but now it happens quite often, thanks to recommender system. So it's, it's a nice side effect if you, if you think about it, okay? And it also makes you hopeful in case you're gonna be a writer or anything like that, because you never know when your content is gonna become uh, very appreciated by people. So all this concept relates to uh, long tails. So the fact that there are a lot of items which are popular and everyone cares about. I'm gonna explain why what this plot is about. But there are also a lot of items that you know are part of this long tail and people enjoy them and people buy these products. You know, here we're talking about music for instance. And the context in which we were before, let's say our you know, primitive recommender systems driven by shell space, they were only targeting the very popular items. But it turns out that there is a lot of interesting stuff also in here. So let's go through this, uh, through this plot, okay? So on the y-axis we have the average number of plays uh, per month on Rhapsody. Uh, Rhapsody is like a, is the old, uh, let's say is the grandparent of Spotify, Apple Music and so forth, okay? It's, it's a stream, it was a streaming service for music. I think it still is a streaming service, yes. Uh, which stand out of Napster. And on this part of the plot, we have the songs that are available both at Walmart, so that they were showed in their shelf space, and also available on Rhapsody, okay? And you see that more or less the, the number of times that they were played were pretty much similar, okay? Like popular items are popular pretty much everywhere. But these are the songs that instead are available only on Rhapsody, okay? Because Walmart couldn't really afford to have all these CDs shown in their shelf space, okay? And what we wanna try to understand today is how big is this long tail? Like how much traffic is driven there and how much purchases, purchases can you drive from this part of the long tail? And it, it turns out is, it's an extremely, uh, it's, it's a big part of the traffic of this platform and also on the purchases that you can get. So let me give you uh, another example for instance. Um, for instance, like documentaries are kind of a 
niche sector. You wouldn't say that they are watched as much as you know a blockbuster movie. And uh, you see that you know Amazon has pretty much the lion's share of them. It was selling back then uh, almost 20,000 titles. Netflix had only a thousand of them, and Blockbuster, which I presume very few of you still remember because it bankrupted a while ago and you, you couldn't find around the US in the past few years or so, was a service where they were renting to you DVDs or in the past even VHS. Um, it turns out, you know, something like Blockbuster where they have to rent tangible physical items uh, couldn't have so many documentaries available, okay? They were betting more on having the Blockbuster movies. So it turns out that they were missing out, for instance, this niche completely, which instead you could get from uh, some hybrid services like Amazon or Netflix. Um, so here is, now um, I'm gonna give you basically some numbers about this long tail. So take, uh, for example, Amazon, which has a total inventory of almost uh, yeah, two million books. And these two million books, it, it turns out that the long tail is driving 57% of the sales. Okay, so if Amazon didn't have such a big catalog, and at the same time, if Amazon wasn't able to recommend you those books, those niche books that you know, are not in the top bestsellers, they will be losing more than half of the revenues on books. Okay, so that's why recommender systems are so important. It's not only because today I'm gonna teach you, you know, uh, some basic techniques on how to build them, but also because if you bring them to a company, they can drive you know, higher revenues. So that's why it, this is extremely interesting. And at the same time, uh, I think we have a small problem with the projector. Okay, uh, let, let me try to close and reopen in the hope that the graph will show. Okay, I, I'll be talking in the meanwhile. So, um, in this plot, <laughs> we had the following. <laughs> so we had, uh, we had a few music artists. I think on top we had Britney Spears, and then here we had Pink, and here we have some bands that were uh, less known. The point is, once Amazon starts to you know, sell you uh, content from Britney Spears back then in the past, then they were also recommending you other bands that, you know, other pop bands that were related. And it turns out that this pop band that ended up being recommended at the same time with a large, you know, uh, with an artist that was getting a lot of traffic, they slowly went up in the ranking very fast, okay? So this is a similar example to what we were seeing before about those two different books. And in here, basically, you, you can see that there has been a shift in terms of how these large companies have been managing their catalogs. So we, we went from the physical retailers to what we were calling back then the hybrid retailers. So let's say Amazon is still kind of an hybrid retailer because they both rent you and send you digital content and at the same time they ship you like books at home. And now we are, we are going forward this pure digital retailer, let's say Spotify, Netflix and so forth where all the data is streamed to you. And naturally their catalogs are just growing bigger and bigger. So the more you move on the right so with the number of titles and the more you are in dire need of having a working recommender system in your platform, okay? So how can we generate our recommendations? What type of recommendations do we have? First of all, you can have editorial and hand curated recommendations. They're, they're very nice for sure. They come to a very high cost. And, it, and it's basically the cost related to the people, to the humans that have to come up with those lists, right? So um, you have this often in uh, music streaming platform. You have you know, playlists curated by Apple, by Spotify and so forth. There is always a person behind them who's taking care and you know, spending their time to create those recommendations. So you can afford having this popular playlist, but you cannot really afford having humans recommending to other people what to listen to, okay? So, so that's one side of, uh, one extreme of our spectrum. Then we have simple aggregates, uh, very famous like from Billboard, so you can have a top 10, most popular, the recent uploads that you got on iTunes and so forth. And on the other side, instead, we have recommendations completely tail tailored to the individual user, okay? And that's what we're gonna see today. So what you experience on a daily basis on Amazon, Netflix, we're gonna see the techniques behind why they're so good at providing you relevant recommendations. Alrighty, so let's try to formalize this a bit. Uh, the, uh, the model from today is relatively simple. So X is our set of customers, of users of the platform. S is our set of items. And ultimately what we want to have is a utility function so that from the Cartesian product of X and S, we want to get the set of ratings. So we want to understand how much is going, this user is going to enjoy a certain item, 
okay? And the ratings could take many different shapes, you know? Uh, you have seen this model of the one to five stars, which are following basically the concept of a Likert scale. Uh, they can be a real number from zero to one. Um, they can be just a Boolean flag, so yes, I like it, no, I don't like it. I think eBay recently moved to that model as well. Each one of these rating schemes comes with pros and cons. There are like countless papers that will explain, oh, if you are in this context, then this is the best rating scale that you could be using, okay? But for today, we're not gonna be focusing on that aspect. Rather, given the rating scale, we're gonna be able to build our utility metrics. Uh, let me see what's going on here, because if we keep on having issues with the slides, it's not gonna be easy. Uh, okay. Let's cross fingers. Perfect, all right, so we have our utility metrics now working. Um, so this is our utility metrics. It's nothing but a matrix representation of items. So in this case, we have movies, avatar, metrics, and so forth. And then on the, on the, on the rows are the users, okay? Our Alice, Bobs, and so forth. And these are the ratings that those users have given in the utility metrics. What is the first thing that you notice out of these metrics? What, what do you think is a potential problem here? Sorry? Sparsity, exactly. So that's gonna be the, the main theme of today. How do we feel the values missing in these metrics? In an ideal world, we would have ratings per e for each user per each item in our catalog, okay? Clearly, this is not the case. We're gonna see also that it's relatively hard to elicit those ratings from the users. Um, so our goal is to find algorithms and techniques to fill in the values missing in these sparse metrics, okay? And clearly, the sparser this gets, the other how our job is gonna be, all right? Okay, so here are the key problems that I was telling to you about. First of all is gathering known ratings for our metrics. And this is mostly driven by the platform. Every time uh, you're on Amazon and you rate a certain item or you put a like on a song on Apple Music or so forth, that's what you're doing. You're giving them your known ratings in their utility metrics, okay? And as we said, it's relatively hard to make sure that every time you listen to something or, or you consume some content, you will be rating that item, okay? So that's why we get these sparse matrices. And second problem, which is gonna be the main theme of the lectures, is extrapolating the unknown ratings from the known ones, okay? So from the signal that we already have containing our matrix, we wanna try to fill in all the missing values, all right? And here, we're, we're not gonna try to cheat, but let's say we're gonna try to relax one constraint. Ideally, we would love to fill in each single value in that matrix and to be as close as possible to the real taste of the user. In reality, most of the times, what we care about are the high ratings. So we, we care about the things that you might likely want to buy or you want to listen to. We don't, we don't care that much knowing that you will hate completely that movie, okay? Because usually you don't recommend things that you're gonna hate, all right? So this is one aspect that will make our lives slightly easier today. And very quickly, uh, uh, at the end of this lecture, we're gonna through some techniques on how to evaluate those extrapolation methods. Because you have to realize that this is the first time that we see a system that is user-facing, okay? Like when we were talking about SBD or LSH, we always had some kind of objective way to evaluate if the system was working well or not. But here it turns out that we have users. You know, this, our recommender system is user facing. So we want to understand from the user if our recommender system is doing a good job or not, okay? So ultimately, a proper evaluation always has the user in front. And it turns out is, less trivial than you might imagine. It's not only about, you know, you're on Amazon, you recommend a certain item, and then you try to see how many times there is a click-through. So like every time a person is interested in it actually clicks on an item or either converts and buys that item. So let me give an example when this could be uh, more challenging. Um, think about a search engine, for instance. Most of your clicks will go on the first or second, you know, result on the, on the result page. It turns out that it doesn't always mean that you believe that content is relevant, okay? So there is this kind of, you know, a noise, noisy signal that a search engine is getting every time you click on the top link. Most of the times we do it just out of, you know, muscle memory. We know that most of the time the first link is correct, therefore we're gonna click on that. And if we take that as a signal that your recommendation was great, it turns out that we're bringing in some noise, okay? So this is usually called in the literature the position bias. The fact that when something is in front of your eyes and you're compelled to click on it, 
you might do it, even though at the end of the day you will find out that that content wasn't relevant to you, right? So just to give a teaser on why this problem is harder than what one might expect. Okay, now let's go one issue at a time. So we said gathering ratings, relatively uh, hard. Usually we ask people to rate the items or to tell us what are, what's their taste. So every time you buy something on Amazon, you get reminders, hey, please leave a review. Uh, it doesn't work very well in practice most of the time. People don't like to be bothered, you know, to, to leave reviews. And one potential solution is to do crowdsourcing. You basically pay people to label the items. Uh, this usually backfires. Can you give me an idea why? What, what is the problem in paying people to leave reviews on your system? Anyone? Yep. Probably you won't want to do that if you're paying them. Exactly. Yeah, or, or any variation out of that. So the answer was uh, they're not going to accept a review in case it's negative because they're paying you. Basically, it means that most of the times, if you're being paid, you're not going to be leaving a truthful review, right? You, you will be paid to leave a certain review. It turns out that there is kind of a, a ghost business out of leaving reviews on Amazon. Um, there are a few articles from uh, not many months ago where they discovered Facebook groups uh, with, you know, with, with moving a sizable amount of money to, to buy reviews on Amazon. And the, the reasons are, you know, multiple. Uh, if you can imagine if you put a new item on Amazon, if you start to get a lot of five-star reviews, this will create some kind of herding effect. You know, people will say, oh, this is amazing. Everyone else thinks it's amazing. I, I should buy it, right? So if you can get a good kickstart, if you start with very good reviews at the beginning, usually that decides the fate of your item on a certain platform, okay? So that's why mostly relying on that can backfire because you're not getting the real um, opinions of people. On the other hand, there is this class of uh, ratings or feedback called implicit ratings. And we can gather that by learning uh, from the user actions. So for instance, if you purchase something on Amazon, usually it implies that at least your expectation is that the item is good, right? So you will be leaving a four or five stars reviews to that item. And at the same time, if you're watching a video on YouTube, if you watch only the first five seconds, probably means that you skipped away. If you watch the whole length of the video, YouTube will use that as, a, as an implicit signal to say, okay, you, you must have liked that video to spend all the time there watching it, right? So this is how implicit feedback works. There is still the problem of you cannot gather the low ratings there, okay? Because for what I just told you, say the example of YouTube, you might have closed the video because you have to run to another class, not because you didn't like it, okay? So it's very hard to distinguish between low ratings and just very short attention span, okay? So <laughs> that's another problem with gathering uh, the ratings. Okay, so this was our first problem in the, in the list. Second one is extrapolating utilities. So filling, out, filling in our metrics, our sparse metrics. And um, the first problem is the fact that um, we're gonna be facing the, the cold start issue. So cold start in recommender systems means the following. First of all, whenever you have a new item coming to the system, it doesn't have any ratings. So as I was saying before, new product on Amazon comes with no ratings at all you're not gonna be able to recommend easily for that item because you pretty much know nothing about it. You don't know what other people think of that. And that's why we end up sometimes, they end up sometimes paying the reviewers for that reason. And at the same time, if a new user registers on your platform, that user comes with no history. And you can, you can imagine that going on a platform like Amazon or Pinterest and getting a blank screen with your own recommendations means that most of the time you will stop going there. Okay, you, you will forget about it or you will not be doing your business there. Um, you, you, I'm, I'm sure you use some systems where at the very beginning when you register, they were trying to elicit information from you. Uh, if you register to Apple Music, for instance, you, you are being asked what are the genre you care about. Uh, it's not because they couldn't do that after a month because you know, they could easily understand what music you like, how, studying your uh, listening history. They want to do it so that right away they can start to recommend you content that is relevant to you, okay? So that's why they waste one minute of your time asking you that so that they can produce a recommendation right away. And that has been studied to, um, to increase the user retention on the platform quite a lot. So what are the three main approaches to building recommender systems? We're going to be seeing two of them today, 
content-based and collaborative filtering. And then on Thursday, we're gonna be going through the latent factor model, which is more powerful and tries to combine information both from users and items. I'm gonna be giving you a teaser about that at the end so that you get an idea of what I'm talking about. Any question before we start to the, before we jump to content-based? All right, let's do this. So content-based recommendations. What is the main idea here? We want to recommend items to, to our customer similar to the previous items rated highly by customer X. Let's go back to our fun example from before the Metallica guy, okay? So if this person has put five stars to most of the metal CDs that he has in his library, then our content-based recommender system will tend to recommend him items that are similar to Metallica and that have been rated highly, okay? So basically what a content-based system does is it understands your profile, the music that you care about, the movies that you care about, and then we'll start to recommend you things that are related to it in terms of genre or in terms of anything like that, okay? So in the case of movies, the kind of features that we can tap into are, for instance, uh, movies with the same actors, from the same director, same genre, and so forth. Or um, say we move to textual content, so we are on, I don't know, Google News that has to recommend us relevant news every day, and it basically will recommend us other sites with similar content. So if you tend to read always, I don't know, news about uh, NBA, then you will keep on getting those articles more and more because the system will understand what you care about, okay? So let's have our uh, small schematics as before to understand what goes on at a very high level in a content-based recommender system. So we have our user, uh, this is a toy example as you can see <laughs> from the figures. So the, the item profiles uh, for this user are uh, red circles and red triangles. And we build what, what, uh, what is the preference profile of this user. So what do we know from there? We know this user likes red. The user cares about circles and triangles, okay? Very easy. Now, we wanna match this profile with our catalog, okay? So this is the amazing catalog of items that we have available. We have a red hexagon, a green circle and square, and a blue square. So what are we gonna do here? We're gonna try to find features that are in common, and boom, we got our recommendations, which in our case will be uh, the red hexagon, because we have the color in common, and then probably we're gonna also recommend the green circle because we know that the user cares about circles, okay? As easy as that. So as we said, for not only for the users, but also for the items, we have to create a profile, okay? So uh, in the toy example from before, the features were the color and the shape, and right now, if you think about slightly more advanced data, so we have movies, we can take the metadata of that movie, or if we have text, for instance, we can try to extract the important words in a document. Um, how do we pick these important features? So today, I'm just, we're just gonna do the example on how to do it with text, and we're gonna be using something coming from a few decades ago for the information retrieval field, which is called TFIDF. So it's term frequency and inverse document frequency. But this should start to give you the idea that one of the main shortcomings for a content-based recommender system is the fact that you need to come up with your own features. And if it's text or if it's relatively trivial data, then this job is not very hard. But let's say you want to recommend movies, but you don't have any metadata about those movies, okay? You don't know who's the director, who are the actors, and so forth. Then you will need to tap into the actual you know, movie file. So you will need to go through the video content and being able to extract features out of there. And as you know, apart, you know, apart from the last few years where uh, deep learning has done some uh, crazy improvements that allow us to you know, look into videos in a very uh, proficient way, this was very hard just a few years ago, okay? So basically, uh, content-based work well when we know how to extract features in a relatively easy way, it can get a lot harder in case the data is more complicated. So le let me give you a brief uh, overview of what is TFIDF so that you can follow me after when we do the example uh, uh, with the articles. So as we said, TF is the term frequency. And what we wanna do here is that we wanna find the frequency of a certain term, which is gonna be basically our feature in a document, and in a, in a document or item J, okay? So first thing that we care about is the TF, which is nothing but 
the frequency of a certain term in a document, so the number of occurrences, and then we normalize it by uh, the highest frequency of, among all the terms appearing in the document. And that's a way basically to discount for very long documents. So say you, that document is a book rather than an article, then the most occurring uh, term will be there a way higher number of times compared to uh, when we are considering a short article, okay? So it's basically just a normalization factor. Uh, if you go on Wikipedia, you will see at least 10 different definitions of what term frequency is, okay? That's been used in many different ways. But I just want you to retain the concept, okay? So TF, term frequency, and then the inverse document uh, frequency is defined in the following way. So our N high is the number of documents that mention the term high. And then N is the total number of documents in our full collection, okay? So what the IDF capture is, how, how discriminative is a certain word, is a certain term, okay? So if you have an actor that appears only in one movie, and you know, only in two movies, let's say, and you watch one of the movies with the doctor, then you will know that quite for sure you will want to watch the other movie from the doctor, okay? If you're instead, I don't know, using as a feature the fact that uh, a certain movie has been released by, I don't know, Universal or one of these major companies that is releasing hundreds of movies per day, uh, sorry, per year, then the IDF will have a low score. It will basically tell you, okay, that's not a very strong feature, you know, the fact that you like a movie uh, from, that, uh, from that company. So this is what the FIDF capture. And basically to generate the score, you, don't, you do just the product between the two, okay? So how do we build now the profile of our document, which in turn is the profile of our item? We just take the set of words with the highest the FIDF scores, and then uh, we take their scores into account, okay? So say we have, I don't know, the, the collection of all the uh, handouts from CS246, then the highest word with TFDF will probably be, I don't know, the, the title of the lectures, okay? So you will find LSH there, recommender systems, and so forth, okay? And that will be the profile of uh, the documents coming from those lectures. Now, now that we know how to generate these profiles, how do we generate the predictions, okay? So there are different ways in which we can generate uh, our user profile. Um, the easiest one that you can think about is just the weighted average of the rated items. So everything that you rated in your, uh, in your past, in your history, becomes part of your profile. Or a variation that is very smart and helps is the fact that you can weight all those different profiles by the rating that you gave to the certain item, okay? So that you will know this person watched that movie but he or she didn't like it because the rating was very low. Therefore, that component will, will have a lesser weight in your profile compared to a movie that you loved, okay? So that's how you build uh, the user profile. And so our prediction heuristic, for example, will be the following. We just compute the cosine similarity of the user and the item profiles, okay? So we, we know how to compute our user profile X. We know our item profile high, and then we just do the cosine similarity, if you recall, is just the dot product between X and I divided by the product of their norms. Now, how do we find the closest uh, items to X, okay? How, how do we find all the movies that that person might be interested in? Um, with, as you recall, we don't want to do all the possible pairwise similarities because it's extremely expensive, and that's where we bring back LSH from two weeks ago, okay? That's, so that's what will help us to find the best candidates in our recommender system. It will tell us, okay, if you like uh, CDs from Metallica, these are the, the, uh, the other albums that are related to it, and those will be your candidates to put now in our prediction heuristic and decide if it should be recommended or not, okay? Yeah, question. Uh, it seems like LSH would get things that were almost too close, maybe, to something the users already seen, like maybe a first edition of a book and a second edition of a book. Great. All you differentiated in that sense such that it's like something new but still close to what they've already seen. Great. So, great question. You pinpointed one of the main shortcomings of content based systems. I'm going to repeat it. So, namely, the, the, the question was. How do you make sure that there is some diversity in the recommendations produced by a content-based system, okay? So, because you, you might be having, in the case of documents, you might be producing recommendations for similar, uh, different editions of the same book, 
or you know, a different revision of, of, of a same document. Um, it turns out that this is one of the main problems of content base, and the only way to you know, work around it is to come up with heuristics. Uh, the model per se will always recommend you what is closest to your profile. Then what you can do is, for example, in the case of multiple editions, you will, make, you will make sure that every time you know that you rated edition number, the third edition of a certain book, you will not be recommending the same book with different edition numbers, okay? But it, but it becomes very cumbersome, as, as you can expect, okay? So we're gonna be seeing ways to, to solve this problem exactly. Okay, so perfect question. Now we're gonna see basically the pros and cons. First, I give you the pros of content-based. Uh, the first one is there is no need for data on other users. So content-based system works exclusively with your profile, okay? I know the documents that you read, I know the books that you like, so it doesn't, it do, it's not bothered by the cold start or the sparsity problem. As soon as I know something about you, okay, I know the few things that you like, then right away I can start to generate relevant recommendations. And it's also able to recommend to users with unique tastes. So if I listen to some uh, niche music, then the system will just match you know, similar albums and recommend them to me, you know, even if they're not popular at all. Okay? And is, uh, with, for the same reason, it's also able to recommend new and unpopular items. So if something, if a new item comes to Amazon and it receives no rating at all, it doesn't mean that it will not be recommended to me, okay? Because it, basically these recommendations are completely decoupled from the ratings that they receive. It's all based on the fact that they're similar to my interest. And last but not the least, and this is a very hot topic uh, today, especially you know, in machine learning in general, this model is able to provide explanations. So if you try to understand why am I being recommended a certain item, it's very easy to produce an explanation of this, right? You can say, that's because you were listening, you bought these 10 albums before, therefore we're recommending you these other two metal albums, for example. And this turns out to be very important, uh, not that much, for instance, for e-commerce websites, but if you see ads that are shown to you on Facebook or Google, for instance, now you can go and check why they're being shown to you, okay? So we're moving towards trying to have models that are interpretable. Okay, so that we, we always want to understand why certain content is showed to the user. And that's one of the nice features of having uh, that we get from a content-based recommender system. Conversely, what are the shortcomings? So as I was saying before, finding the appropriate features is hard. So both finding them and also constructing them in some cases. So as we were saying before, multimedia data, it gets harder to build a, a good content-based system. Uh, how do we build recommendations for new users? This is an example that I was telling to you before, for instance, about Apple Music. The fact that you register and they're gonna ask you what are the genres that you care about. If you don't have this initial kickstart with a few information about the user, then you will not be able to recommend the user anything at all, okay? And last but not the least, related exactly to the question that we just heard of, is the over-specialization, the fact that you, you will never recommend items that are outside of the user's scope, okay? So the user will only get things that you already listened to or you already uh, read about. And another issue is the fact that people tend to have multiple interests, okay? Uh, unless you're on a very niche website where, I don't know, you're selling only a certain specific type of item, most of these large platforms, they will sell you pretty much everything or you will find any possible genre of music on the streaming platform. So it's very hard to pinpoint a user on one specific taste, right? So, and that's another shortcoming of these content-based systems. Now, last but not the least, and this will help us to jump to the next part of the lecture, is the fact that we are not exploiting at all the quality judgments of the other users. So if you remember, when we started today, I gave you this, you know, uh, initial introduction about how you gather the ratings, how the ratings look like, the utility metrics, and so forth. Now, if you realize in the past 10 years or, or so, we totally skipped the quality judgments. We didn't use them at all, okay? So it's clear that there is a low-hanging fruit here that we can exploit, and that's exactly what we're gonna be seeing now, okay? So that's why now we're gonna be jumping to the collaborative filtering. Any question before we, we are on this section? Okay. So first of all, why is it called collaborative filtering? Um, collaborative because every user in the platform collaborates 
to get a higher quality in the recommendation generated by our system. So every time you leave a rating on the platform, then you're giving additional information to the system, okay? So this is the collaborative part. And filtering is basically recommendations, is what we were saying at the beginning, the fact that <coughs> there is just too much choice from these very large catalogs, so you wanna filter them out only to the information relevant to our user, okay? So that's why we call it collaborative filtering. And what is the setting of the problem? So we're back to having our user X, and what we wanna do here is that we wanna find a set of other N users whose ratings <coughs> are similar to the, to the ratings of X, okay? And then we're gonna be trying to estimate the ratings of X based on the ratings of the other users, all right? Okay, so everything explained well here. Here we have our database with all the users from which we can search and get the nearest neighbors. We will see that this is one of the expensive operations as you can imagine, but we learn how to find nearest neighbors in an efficient way. Then on top we have our user X and we're gonna try to match with a group of users that left ratings and then we say okay, wh whatever these similar users have liked, we're gonna be recommending them to X, okay? That's the whole setting of collaborative filtering. And as you m might have realized already, we just went to the opposite direction of now completely ignoring the content and just working with the ratings, okay? So now we're at the opposite side of the spectrum. A system like this can recommend you pretty much anything, you know? Like you're on Amazon and it can, it can recommend at the same time a movie and a, and a CD and a piece of clo or clothing, okay? Because it doesn't know at all what is the item behind it. It just knows the rating that that item received from the users. Okay, so here's our setting. We have, uh, we have the ratings of two users. So we have, you know, uh, the ratings of X and the ratings of Y. So X left, uh, there are five items in total in the catalog. Left, X left one star for item one, three stars for items five, and so forth. And as you can see from there, there is not always an overlap on the items that have been rating, okay? So sometimes people are rating clearly different items. So we get our R of X, which is the vector of all the ratings left by X. And the first thing that we might try to do, for instance, is to use the Jacquard similarity. We've seen that in LSH. We know that it's a quite nice similarity measure and say, why don't we use that? The reason is it ignores completely the values of the rating, okay? So, what basically we will represent R of X and R of Y as sets, and then here it will tell us that there are only two ratings in common, okay? But it doesn't tell us if the users are really liking the same items or not. Question? Would it be possible to do similarity as multisets? What, what do you mean by that? So if someone um, gave an item three stars, you'd put the item in the set three times, and so... Oh. Um, yeah, yeah, the, 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 that's a cool workaround. What, what I will show you today is that there are basically measures, similarity measures that are even more powerful than that. Uh, it, it will work, uh, but it makes it also less computationally efficient compared to what we're gonna see. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's a cool hack. <laughs> okay, a second idea. We, 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 we could be using the cosine similarity, for instance, uh, that we are reminded before how it works. The problem here is that Whenever a certain rating is missing, and as you recall, ratings are missing oftentimes, uh, they will be treated as negatives, okay? So they will be treated like a zero. And this is a, this is a noisy signal, okay? This is not a zero in reality. We don't know what the user thinks about a certain item. So whenever we do the cosine similarity, we have these components where we don't have the rating that go to zero and kind of squeeze towards the wrong direction um, the, the profile of, of that certain item. So we don't, we don't want to use cosine similarity for, for that reason. So the good similarity here, the good coefficient to use, is the Pearson correlation coefficient, okay? And what it does is the following. So first of all, we take into account only the items rated by both the users, okay? So we have our user X and Y, and the similarity between X and Y, as you can see, is only, due, uh, is only based on the items that are rated in common. And what we do here at the end of the day is, first of all, we, we compute the average, okay? So um, these are the average rating for X and Y. Why do we have this kind of like correction factor? Because as you know, some users are extremely critics. You know, if you go on Amazon or IMDb, you would see people destroying pretty much every single item they buy 
or, they, or every movie they watch. And conversely, some people are more lenient. You know, they tend to give five stars and are enthusiastic about everything. So we get this correction factor, and then we go and check for each item how far away we are from the average rating of that user, okay? So if we are above of the average, then we know that ideally the user should be more enthusiastic about it. If we are far, if we get a far less than the average, then we know that for sure the user hated that item or movie or so forth, okay? So if you go and check the definition of the person correlation, is basically the covariance divided by the standard deviation. The, the intuition that I want you to keep out of this coefficient is the following. We, we just wanna see if these two variables are linearly correlated, okay? So we wanna find users that tend to like the same items and tend to dislike the same items. That's what this uh, coefficient captures for us, okay? And that's why it's very powerful and we're gonna be using it uh, throughout the lecture. So as we said, intuitively, for instance, in, in this case, uh, we have our metrics on the, on the columns, we have movies, and on the rows we have users, and we want the similarity, for instance, between A and B to be larger than the similarity between A and C, for, for example, right? So the reason why we want A and B to be more similar is because on the first Harry Potter movie, they have very similar high ratings, okay? Conversely, if you check A and C, they have in common just these two movies, and you see that their ratings are flipped. Okay, whenever a user A likes a movie, then user B dislikes the movie, okay? So that's why, um, as I was saying before, the Pearson coefficient tries to capture the covariance of these two variables, okay? So let's see what happens now with all the different uh, similarity metrics that we mentioned before. So first of all, we, we wanna check the Jacquard similarity, which gives us exactly the opposite result. So you see similarity of A and B is one-fifth, while similarity of A and C is two-fourths. So it will tell us that among all the, all the movies that have been rating, um, in, the, in the Jacquard similarity, we just find that A and B have rated only uh, one movie in common, okay? So it doesn't capture the fact that they like the same movie. If we compute the cosine similarity, at least now the, the, the direction of the inequality is correct, but as I was saying before, this is considering the missing ratings as negative, so it's kind of squeezing those scores close to the same value, and you can see that the difference between user A and B is pretty much negligible, okay? So we don't like these values to be so close to each other because A and B and A and C instead are very much different in our profile. So we bring in our person coefficient, and we do some of the math, and we found out that the, uh, there is now a substantial difference between the similarity uh, of user A and B and the similarity of user A and C, all right? So this example basically should convince you that this is the, the right way to go in terms of selecting um, a similarity measure. Okay, so now that we pinpointed what uh, kind of measure we want to use, we're gonna be doing the following. So we have our, uh, again, our Rx vector, which is the vector of all the user um, uh, ratings. And then we get, we have uh, N to be the set of K users more similar to uh, X where rated the item I. So basically we are gonna be finding the nearest neighbors. We're gonna be finding a set of users which is similar enough to me, and those users will, I will, um, I will leverage the ratings of those, of those users to produce my own recommendations, okay? So, how do we do that? How do we produce uh, the, the recommendations? The first very easy way to do it is once I selected my neighbors, then I just take their ratings on the item that I haven't rated yet and just do the average, okay? So that's already a good way to, to generate um, a recommendation. If I know that users similar to me uh, have, you know, have similar music taste and I will get uh, their own average recommendation on a new album. Or what else can we do which is even slightly better? We can try to weight the different recommendations generated by my neighbors based on the similarity that I have with them, okay? So the more similar I am to a certain neighbor, the higher weight I will give to the recommendation of the neighbor, okay? Question. <laughs> Oh, so for the cosine similarity, unfortunately, 
first I will repeat the question. How do we deal with the missing ratings in our utility, utility metrics up there? Uh, in the case of the cosine similarity, unfortunately, we don't deal with the missing ratings. That's the problem. They go to zero. And when they go to zero, we get this issue that they're considered as negative ratings rather than as missing. So that's why we see those two scores basically squeezing and getting close to each other. And the reason why we like to use the Pearson coefficient instead is the fact that we only work with items that have been rated by both the users, okay? So we, we, if we are the two users in the system, we build our similarity profile based only on the items that we both rated, okay? And that allows us to basically ignore all the other items that haven't been rated by us. Sounds good? Great. Question? Sells like tens of thousands of different items. You could have like that the number of people, most users will have zero things in common. So you're throwing out like all the, almost all of the data. Perfect. So, great question, and you pinpointed one of the main shortcomings of this approach. So the question was, what if we have a very large catalog in my system, and what are the odds that users will have certain items rated in common? It turns out they are very low. <laughs> so that's, that's the issue why uh, you, you can't really use collaborative filtering out of the box, and the reason why um, at the end of this lecture on Thursday we're gonna be seeing more advanced techniques. Uh, as you can imagine, like, these kind of techniques are like 15 years old or so, so we didn't have such gigantic catalogs back then in e-commerce platforms, okay? So um, at that time, this approach was still uh, feasible. If you try to apply today to Amazon, which I believe has in the order of millions of items, clearly it wouldn't be working as well as you would hope, okay? Great question, thanks. Yeah? Dimensionality reduction to make the space less sparse in the new collaborative program, or would that not be very Perfect, good? great question. Can you use dimensionality reduction to make this matrix less sparse? That's exactly the content of what we're gonna be seeing on Thursday. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the Netflix challenge and the fact that you can do this latent factor decomposition, and that's a dimensionality reduction technique. So yeah, great intuition. Anything else? Okay, let's move forward. So. I gave you, you know, a basic idea of how we can produce these recommendations based on your neighbor users. There are many other tricks possible, you know, other variations of these formulas that can make it slightly more accurate, but you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't make a big difference. Now, until now, we talk about user-user collaborative filtering, okay? Let's now try to see the other side of the coin, so we can also have an item-item recommender system, right? We can try to find you have a new item going into the system, we're trying to find similar items, and then we generate the ratings coming from the similar items, okay? So the problem is, uh, is peculiar to what we were seeing before. For item I, we want to find the other similar ones, and then we want to estimate the rating for item I based on the ratings coming from the similar items, okay? And the cool thing here is that we can pretty much reuse everything that we've seen until now. So the same similarity matrix and the prediction functions, they're all gonna be based exactly on the, on the same concept, okay? So let's go through, I will guide you through an example so that you will make things uh, clearer. So this is our item, item, item scenario. Our, the columns are the users in our system, the rows are movies, and we set our, uh, the size of our neighborhood, the parameter up there, we set it equal to two, okay? So we're gonna be working with just two neighbors at a time. What do we wanna do? What is our task? We wanna estimate the rating of movie one by user five, okay? So we, we have that empty cell in our sparse utility matrix and we wanna try to find a, a good rating for that movie because uh, user five is considering watching it. So the first thing that we wanna do here, we're gonna be computing the Pearson similarity among all the items, okay? So among the uh, the, the different movies. So we're gonna be doing the similarity between one, which is the movie for which we wanna produce the, the recommendation rating, and all the other movies. And we found out that movie three and movie six have a high uh, similarity score. You can you know, quickly convince yourself qualitatively of this just by going through the scores and see you know, that these, these items tend to be you know, score uh, low by the same user, and same year they get a two and a three, and then they get a four and a uh, five and a four by user 11. So you see they are, they are, very, they are cover rating basically together, okay? So now that we have, uh, we have computed these scores, 
then we, we have our neighbor selection. We're going to say, okay, movie three and movie six are our two uh, nearest neighbors, and that's what we're going to use to generate our recommendations. Now, if we go through the techniques we've seen before on how we can produce a rating, uh, the very first one we saw was we can compute the average. So 2 plus 3 divided by 2, 2.5. So that would be one way to assign the score there. Or we can go with this slightly more advanced technique where we take into account the, uh, the similarity weights, okay? So we see that the similarity between user 1 and 3 is 0 0.4. So we want to be rating this score lower than the similarity between 1 and 6, okay? Because uh, movie 1 and 6 tend to be more similar, okay? So we take those two weights into account. We just do this simple math, and then we get with a 2.6 in the predicted rating for that movie, okay? Which sounds pretty reasonable given the other ratings that you can see in that matrix. Okay, so this is a very uh, basic view on how we can do item-based item recommender systems. Uh, let me give you um, some, you know, additional tips and tricks on how this can be made m even more accurate. So, um, we have seen how to define the similarity, how to select the nearest neighbor. Now, can we try to bring in some um, prior information coming from all the ratings from the system? And the answer is yes, you know, just instead of generating our rating only based on the uh, ratings of that movie given, of the ratings uh, given to that movie by other users, we also can bring in a baseline estimate. So why does this help? Having a baseline estimate helps, especially when you don't have a lot of ratings about uh, that movie already, or if you don't have you know, a lot of ratings in general in your platform. So what, what can you do in that case? We can introduce this, we can call it a bias term basically, which is formed by these three different components. So first of all, we can bring in uh, the, the overall mean uh, or the overall average of the movie rating. Why is this useful? Um, as I was saying before, there are some platforms that tend to be way more critic than others. So I think there have been some studies between, for instance, IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes, and you can see that sometimes the ratings there diverge quite a lot, especially between the critics and the public. So first of all, you, you want to take into account what is the overall mean uh, rating on that platform, okay? And then the other thing that you want to do is uh, you want to rate the deviation of user X. Basically, this is what uh, we, we took into account before also in the Pearson coefficient. We, we want to see what is the average rating of the user X compared to the mean movie rating. So wh what we're capturing with, capturing with B of X is how uh, how lenient or how strict is a certain user, okay? So is this user pretty much aligned with the movie rating on the platform or does it tend to be more lenient or stricter? And last but not the least, we want to bring in also this other baseline information about the deviation of movie high. So this basically captures, is this movie doing very well? Is it getting a lot of positive reviews? If yes, we're already going to boost the, the, the baseline rating for that item, okay? So as you can see, basically, recommender systems are usually built in a, or you know, organical and uh, incremental way. So first, we, we brought in this concept of collaborative filtering, where we try to use uh, information from other users or from other items. And then we're trying to bring in some you know, additional baseline coming from the domain knowledge of the old platform, OK? And you will find counters of paper in the literature of other bias terms that can be introduced to make the system even more accurate. Okay, but this, you know, this tends to be a very good initial approach that works extremely well in practice. Okay, so to recap, basically we've seen that um, it's relatively easy and fast to make a natin atom recommender system work, and it turns out that most of the times it works better than a user-user recommender system. Can you give me an idea why this is the case? Why do you think it's more reliable to build an item item recommender system rather than a user user? Yeah, the, it's correct. Can I give intuition why that's the case? Yeah, so it's correct what you said. You, you can group more easily items in coherent sets. Why is it the case? Can, can you get some ideas why that happens? 
for instance, users tend to change their taste over time. So after a while, it's, it's very hard. If you have been a Netflix user for 10 years, just by getting in, taking into account all your ratings, it's very hard to pinpoint you to a certain genre. Um, if you, conversely, if you have to recommend items, and you're recommending music albums, something is not gonna be uh, Baroque music from the 17th century and a metal album at the same time, right? It will belong only to a specific genre, okay? So that's why it tends to be easy to work with item items. They are more strictly defined, their profile is more stable over time, while users tend to be harder to uh, profile. And we're gonna be seeing that one of the techniques uh, you will be talking about uh, on Thursday tries exactly to overcome this problem, okay? Okay. So let's go again. Uh, we're gonna do it now also for collaborative filtering, <coughs> pros and cons of this approach. As I told you at the beginning, it works for any kind of item, okay? So the system is completely oblivious of what is the item that is being recommended, okay? And you don't have to perform any feature selection. You don't have to understand how to extract features from the data. Conversely, it has the issue of the call start. You need enough users and ratings in the system to find a good match, okay? So, uh, when, for instance, in the item item case, if items don't receive any recommendation at all, they will never be promoted into a neighbor so that you can use them to produce recommendations. So, this is a very common problem uh, with uh, collaborative filtering. Then, once again, we have the issue of sparsity, the fact that this matrix is very sparse, it's hard to find users that have rated the same item, so that's related to the question that uh, we heard before, and at the same time, it's also hard um, to find items that have been rated uh, multiple times by, uh, by different users. There is also the issue of the first rater. So you cannot recommend an item that has not been previously rated, right? Because you don't know with what you're gonna match it. It's a, it's a totally uh, blank row in our utility matrix. And this is especially problematic for new items or esoteric items, you know, things that get very few ratings, they tend to, you know, get in the long tail of your catalog and pretty much disappear unless they get a lot of traffic. And this is, for instance, the example of the book that we were talking about before, you know, until it caught up, until people started to generate a lot of reviews about it, it, it just went, you know, off radar for, for many years. So that's, that's another issue. Uh, conversely, there is also another an interesting catch about the first rater problem, the fact that these platforms tend to have this herding effect. The fact that if you start to get very bad reviews at the beginning, then most of the users will either not buy your item or just leave bad reviews, or if everyone is enthusiastic, then your content becomes viral and everyone leaves very good reviews. So uh, marketing is slowly turning from, you know, just generating ads and commercials into also how to effectively leverage recommender systems because as we said before, they really drive uh, user purchases quite a lot. And last problem is that they're affected by what we call the popularity bias. So these systems tend to recommend uh, items that are more popular, okay? So it's very hard to recommend items to people that have unique taste. And we have seen instead that a content-based recommender system was doing a pretty good job at recommending these unique items. And also for this reason, uh, the fact that it tends to recommend mostly popular items, it's very well known in the recommender systems, you know, research field, that a popularity-based recommender system is very hard to beat oftentimes. So if you are on Amazon and during, I don't know, prime day, you tend to recommend the 50 items that people are <coughs> buying most of the times, you will be doing a very good job. You know, so as, as unexciting as it might sound because it's just keeping a counter next to an item, that's, that's how it goes oftentimes with recommender systems, okay? And I will invite you now later when you go and back and check the slides and you will see that pretty much the pros and cons of collaborative filterings are specular to the ones of content-based recommender systems. So as a matter of fact, uh, you will see in textbooks and in papers, there are a lot of systems called like hybrid approaches where they try to bring in both the benefits of collaborative filtering and of content-based systems together in order to build a better overall recommender system, okay? That's exactly what I have in these slides. So these hybrid methods that try to compensate uh, the problems of each other. Okay, any question or we, we jump to the last part of the, of the lecture? Okay, 
let me guide you quickly through that. So right now, I just want to give you a few you know, remarks, practical tips in case you will be developing your own recommender system in the near future. So some pointers uh, of you know, things that you should never forget to check. So we're going to be talking about evaluation, how we uh, check the error metrics, and also what is the complexity and the speed uh, to run a recommender system in production. So first of all, how do we perform evaluation? And uh, bear with me, this is not the user-facing evaluation that I was mentioning to you before, okay? This is just based on our utility metrics. What we do is the following. We just have our you know, user's movie metrics. We mask part of it, okay? And we use it as a test data set, like very common jargon for machine learning as well. So we mask this part of the metrics, and we want to be able to reconstruct those ratings that now are missing. So we... When we then produce the recommendations for those mask ratings, we can use different uh, measures to realize uh, how, how good uh, the recommender system is performing. The first one that can come to your mind is the root mean square error, or RMSE, which is very common. And what it does is it, it just shows you the deviation between the actual rating and the rating produced by your system. And it combines all these errors together. So the pros of this measure is that it just gives you one number. So you can easily, you know, you can tune the parameters of your axis and then decide, oh, I, now I get a lower RMSC, therefore I'm doing a better job. It turns out that it doesn't really help you as a real world measure. The reason is what I mentioned to you at the beginning, we mostly care about doing a very good job at recommending the highly rated items. So that's where we don't want to make errors. If we do you know, a subpar job in the items that are rated at one or two stars, no one really cares, okay? So that's why the RMSC can be misleading at times. So for that reason, another measure that is often uh, recommended is to use the precision at top 10. So whenever I'm showing you, you know, a set of recommendations, say on Amazon, I wanna, see, uh, I wanna measure how many in the top 10, which is, you know, it's a K, you know, it's a K parameter. You can be precision at K, basically, you know? Yeah, you decide, I want to show five recommendations, 10 of them, and how many of them are going to be relevant to the user. This is a way more relevant, you know, uh, metric to understand how good of a job you're doing, okay? And last but not the least, people are also using the rank correlation, which is nothing but a measure that captures how good is a ranking. So we, we don't care about the scores that we are assigning to the ratings. We don't care about just the top 10, how they are appearing. We rather care about how close is the ranking that you produce compared to the real one. So what is the order of the top items that you're gonna be showing to the user, okay? So keep in mind this mismatch between RMSC and measures that are more useful in the real world. Another approach uh, that is also very interesting, which sometimes is called the, the zero one model, and it applies very much to this implicit uh, feedback that I was telling to you about before, is the fact that sometimes these recommender systems don't work with ratings. So you, you don't have the luxury of having access to you know, one to five stars like in Netflix or so forth. You just know if uh, someone is watching a bit on YouTube or not, okay? Like that is our zero one model. If that's the case, there are some other measures that are extremely important. First of all is the coverage measure, okay? This is a, really a must-have every time you develop a recommender system. This is something that you want to try to compute as quickly as possible. It basically tells you, given my users on the system, for how many of them can I make predictions, okay? And again, we said this in the context of all these e-commerce websites, for example. If you end up on Amazon, Pinterest, or anywhere that is driving commerce, and you don't provide predictions to 90% of the users of the system, then you're losing a lot of revenues for that reason, right? So that's why this is extremely important. You, you might prefer a recommender system that does a worse job on the top 10% of the users, but is rather able to produce recommendations for your whole user base, okay? So coverage, extremely important. Then other measures like precision or the rock curve and AUC curve that basically tell you what is the accuracy of your predictions, which is, am I creating false, po am I predicting false positives or false negatives, okay? So very similar to what you've been studying in machine learning as well, um, and they apply very well to this zero one uh, model. Now, um, other issues that you might be having with the, with the error measures, they are, they have a very narrow focus, you know? They are mostly focused on the, on the accuracy of the system. What are other things that we care about? 
So first of all is the prediction diversity, which is sometimes called like this, the serendipity. The fact that, uh, as you know, the, the question that uh, we, we got uh, at, the, at the beginning of the lecture, you don't wanna always recommend the same things to the user. You know, you, you wanna have, you know, say three recommendations out of 10 should be things that are not strictly related to what the user likes. And that, that has been proved to be something that drives, you know, more views on YouTube or more purchases on Amazon, okay? So that's one thing that uh, is often included into more advanced recommender systems. Um, other things are, for instance, you wanna leverage the prediction context. If you're coming from a purchase session where we were checking, you know, shoes and trousers, then you might want to recommend a jacket. Or, you know, you have other features that can play a role in there. And also, you know, the order in which you generate these predictions uh, make, uh, plays a role as well, okay? So in practice, um, the takeaway that I, that I want you to have from this uh, part of the lecture is that some of, these, um, some of these error metrics might penalize a method that does instead well for high ratings and badly for the others. So you don't wanna fall into this mistake, okay? So don't rely only on RMSE. And last but not the least, uh, very quickly, we're gonna go through the complexity. So we talk often about you know, uh, the fact that you want to get neighboring items or neighboring users. And the most expensive step is to basically find the case, the K most similar customers or the K most similar items. But we learn how to do that, okay? So instead of being a quadratic problem, we can pre-compute it, make it linear, and that's where we use our LSH, that's where you know, we can cluster users that are similar, we pre-compute it once, and then we know if users belong to the same cluster or not. We can apply dimensionality reduction, so, what I told you on you know, the second slides of today, the fact that everything we built on top of dealing with highly dimensional data would help us today applies exactly here because it allows us to build systems that are scalable and that can run with millions of users, okay? So that's the insight about the, uh, the, the complexity. And this is more a personal tip. You, whenever you, uh, you have the luxury of having access to so much data, you wanna try to leverage all of it, okay? So do, don't try to reduce the data size just because you wanna use some you know, fancy algorithms that you've seen in an obscure paper. It turns out that most of the times, simple methods on large data do you know, trump everything else. They, they do the best. Um, so it would be way better for you, let's say you, know, you have INDB data and you're able to add also the genre, all the actors, so use all the data that you have available rather than you know, betting on uh, some obscure mathematical models. Clearly, both of them have a role, but you know, this is the low hanging fruit. This is what gives you the best performance, first of all. And then after, you can care about optimization, okay? There are a lot of interesting articles about this. There's this one, you can check it from the slide. There is the unreasonable effect in episode data from Peter Norvig and other distinguished uh, scientists at Google, which is, you know, it applies to machine learning in general. So those are very interesting things uh, to read that really put in this mindset that using all the data that you have tends to pay off more than having very advanced models. Question. Does the pre-computation help us to solve the, the coverage problem? Yeah. Um, um, no, not really. It, it, re it really depends if you are working item item or user user. So the pre-computation allows you to find the candidates as quickly as possible. But if your data is shaped in such a way that you don't find neighbors because you, know, you just arrived to the system, for example, and you don't have any ratings assigned to you, then there might be no coverage for that reason, okay? So um, the, the pre-computation is more about being able to run it at scale and in production so that you get real-time recommendations. Thanks, great question. Anything else? Okay, then I will give you a very short teaser about what we're gonna be seeing on Thursday. So on Thursday we're gonna be talking about the Netflix price and in general the latent factor models, which is very powerful and it kind of embodies all the different things that we've seen today and puts them into a single uh, elegant framework so that you know, we can uh, leverage data coming from the ratings, coming from the content and so forth. So what was the Netflix price? So Netflix gave training data to the public they, they gave 100 million movie ratings uh, from a user base of roughly 500,000 of them pertaining 18,000 movies, okay? And these ratings have been generated in six years, from 2000 to 2005. Then they, they retain a small test data set 
uh, with uh, roughly 3 million uh, ratings. And the evaluation criterion, which kind of disproves everything I was telling you about before, <laughs> is the RMSC. And the reason there is because it's, it's very easy to evaluate, okay? So that's why they, they shaped it as a, into an RMSC problem. And they gave, to, uh, they published the result that their own uh, internal recommender system algorithm was obtaining. So the Cinemach uh, RMSC was 0 0.95, okay? And the prize was all about $1 million for a 10% improvement on Cinemach, okay? And as you can imagine, you know, $1 million is not only about the fame of doing an interesting scientific paper, but you know, people didn't mind about uh, getting a significant amount of money, so the competition received almost 3,000 teams, okay? And you will see this, you will hear this amazing story on Thursday, uh, but you know, towards the end, teams start to, started either to compete or to help each other, you know, they made deals to split the prize and so forth. So it was a, it was a very interesting uh, period, you know, for recommender systems. But you know, a, apart from the funny details that we're gonna be hearing from on Thursday, the nice, uh, strong scientific outcome of that competition was the fact that uh, it was the first time uh, um, that researchers came with this idea of latent factor models. So the latent factor models are nothing but funding uh, clusters where both the users and the atoms are projected into the same space, okay? So we're basically embedding users and atoms together, okay? So we're gonna have, let's have a, uh, a representation like this one, okay? So this is a simplistic example. We just have two dimensions. You know, we have movies going from more serious to funnier and then geared towards more males and female. So you, you project uh, the movies in, the, in this latent space and then you have the different uh, users that are being projected in the same embedding space. And then we just get the neighbors in, in this d-dimensional space, okay? So you know that gas will likely most Independence Day and so forth and you, re and you produce recommendations in that way. Uh, so I'm gonna be closing with this slide. This is just a, a 2D projection of the two main latent factors. And if you go through the titles, you will see some kind of regularities, you know? Movies that, some movies are more action movies, some others are more romantic and so forth. So basically you see we're bringing in characteristics from the users, the ratings from the users, the content of the movies and so forth. And this turned out to be um, the, the winning technique of the Netflix challenge. I'm gonna wrap it up here. I'm happy to take questions in case you have any doubts left. Thank you.